Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Bernard Harris, and welcome to B Talk. Today, we have a special guest with us, professional basketball player Sean Huff. I played with Sean's father in 1974 on the U.S. national team, so I've known Sean all of his life. Welcome to the show, Sean. How Thank are you? you? Thank you. I'm doing well. Good, good, good. Can I? I, I have to get something because this is this is. Wait, I have to show you something. You'll love this. Wait. Okay. Okay. Cool. Wait, just a second. No problem. Yeah, this is gonna take a minute because you said about the national team, and I was just actually, I was just a little while ago. I was going through some some pictures. Show it to you real quick. I think you'll get a kick out of this. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that's the team. That's the team. Exactly. I, this is the team you're talking about. That's the team I'm talking about. I guess we were yeah. in Moscow at the time. And, and that's evidence, just so everybody that, knows. That's evidence. That's evidence right there. Just so everybody know I'm not lying. Uh Sean's father happens to be Leon Huff. And Leon had quite an outstanding career here in in Finland. So I've I've known I've known you guys for seems like forever. And uh, you're quite busy nowadays, Sean. You you uh, your team, the Helsinki Seagulls. You're in the middle of the playoffs, and you have an election coming up. So how are you handling that? Don't forget, I also have a. Uh... Uh, two kids, you know, and a family. Yeah. So. <laughs> <And> you, <laughs> it's, it's not like I, not like I come home from practice and then you know it's like oh let me just throw myself on the couch and uh, <laughs> relax. So, yeah, so. but uh, I'd say time management. I say you just you just want to be as efficient as you can with your time. I feel like uh, if you put in the effort and you you try to organize your days as as best you can and try to plan ahead I feel like you can you can get a lot of stuff done I think uh, you know the election is, is tough but and it's, it takes a lot of time but it was it was moved back to June that obviously helps because you know gives me gives me um, gives me more time to uh, prepare for the playoffs and and do everything else but it's you know it's it's time management <laughs> well, you seem to be doing a pretty good job. I behind the scenes, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so before before we go any further, uh, I got a trivia question for the viewers. Uh, what connection does Dallas Cowboys running back Ezekiel Elliott have with Finland? And I will answer that question later on in the, in the show. So you got a, uh, a quite impressive resume in your, your basketball resume, Sean. Uh, Thank you. You're, you're, you're a two-time Finnish champion. You played four years at Valparaiso University. Uh, you've been playing as a professional since 2008, I believe. And you're also the captain of the Finnish men's national team. That's quite impressive. And I think you've handled that quite well. So tell us how you got started in basketball. Well, I got started, uh, I think a little bit later than usual. I think I started at 12, like organ with organized basketball. I mean, basketball was always a part of my life with, uh, you know, going to dance games, Kisa Holly and running around there. And I kind of, you know, I've always been used to the sound of the, you know, squeaking sneakers <laughs> in the basketball gym. But it's, it was something that, that I didn't really pick up until I was 12. But when I when I picked it up, it was really something that I I really, really valued. And I kind of poured everything into it. OK. Who was your favorite player at the time? I started in 96. My favorite player at the time was probably Sean Kemp because just all the flashy dunks and explosive style of play and. I kind of wanted to be different. I think everybody loved Jordan, and he was everybody's favorite. I didn't want to. I wanted somebody else to be my favorite player. Yeah, yeah, the rain, the rain man. I think I think a lot <laughs> of people, a lot of people loved the rain man at the time. Yeah. You know, when you were younger, did you have any any dreams of being a professional, or what? What were your dreams? 
I mean, I kind of knew right away that basketball was something that I wanted to do. I feel like I could be good at it, but it was also it was also fun, and I loved playing it. And of course, you know, my dreams was to play at a you know at a high level, you know, NBA or wherever I could be. But I just knew it took a lot of work, and I knew you know whatever whatever happened that if as long as I you know you know work work my butt off and just just try to try to give the game everything I can, the game will give back. You know what it can, and I feel like I did. You know, I, uh, I, you know, accomplished a lot of stuff for sure in my career. It's not over yet. Still trying to do things, but it was, it was definitely a dream of mine to, you know, play professional and just, just to be the, be a complete player too. I was just, you know, a lot of my dad preached to me when I was young. You know, you can't just do one thing and you can't do that. And he was always telling me about college. He's like. We got guys who can shoot the ball and <laughs> score all the time, but you know, like, but you know what? They're sitting at the end of the bench because they can't play defense. They can't guard anybody. And that's kind of, you know, a big influence was you know him and you know my dad's friends like you and you know Greg, just you know always always telling me about the game and just to be a complete player. Yeah, yeah, and 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 he told you the truth. Did you <laughs> did you ever feel any any pressure growing up? Because your dad was was quite famous in Finland as a player, did you ever feel any of that pressure that you had to live up to a certain standard? Uh, I think, I think yeah, there was probably you know probably some pressure because you know I go into basketball, so everybody knows my father. They know what he's done. You know, they know the stories about him, what he's done. But also, I kind of, I think something that I've done probably done my whole career is kind of. Like I've dissected it into smaller goals and smaller pieces. You know, if you start, sometimes if you start staring at the big picture, you you kind of freeze and you don't know what to do. But if I set my goals as to you know this year I need to learn this or I need to you know learn how to dribble better with my left or I, and I kind of kind of take those baby steps. It kind of uh, kind of takes away that takes away that pressure of worrying about the big picture where I'll be where I'll be at the end and kind of just enjoy the journey and enjoy the road that takes you there. You grew up as a you grew up in the Topo system, and as a junior, and then you moved on to to Honka. Uh, I guess that was a pretty exciting time for you because uh, Honka at that time was probably the strongest club in the country, and I was also working at Honka at that time, so that was probably exciting for you too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But those those were those were good times at at, at Honka, and you played for Mikhail Pavlosevich. Yes, uh, has that had in, and he was quite quite known as quite a good coach. Has that had any influence on you in your career? Oh, definitely. He was very you know he was very demanding and uh, very hard, tough coach. But definitely, it was. I always wanted to search for that you know like like what can make me better. What's gonna make me a better player? Yeah. And you know, I always hear stories about Dad talking about how he used to play against older players in the park and how that made him better. And I knew, like, even at age of 15, I already knew that I I need to start playing with grown men to make me better. Because at 15, I felt like I could already physically dominate, you know, the youth leagues. I was physically just, but I, when I went up and played with the men, all of a sudden it wasn't that. Oh, you come at the basket. Boom, take that, you know, where you yeah, going? Yeah. Like, you, know, like, you know, all of a sudden I'm flying around and it's not that easy. Now I got to figure things out. So when I was 17, you know, I kind of looked at, you know, the teams here at the area and um, there was a chance to go to Honka and Honka was a very competitive team at the time and the top team. And I just knew the level of practice and what I would be required every day to do. I just knew it was either sink or swim. It would make me a better player. And it was just something that I wanted to do. And also, you know, especially the first year, having a chance to, you know, like practice with the men and, you know, uh, get some minutes there, but the chance to be with you and play with the 22 and under would also, you know, kind of keep my rhythm and keep my touch to the game too. So I wouldn't lose that. Those were some 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 good times. So you moved on, you won a couple of championships with Honka. You moved on to Valparaiso University. What was the difference uh what was the thing that shocked you most about going to the states and playing i think the i think one of the things that about uh probably savage coach probably savage that really helped me going to the states is him being so brutal the first three years <laughs> you know there it kind of it, it kind of <laughs> eased it kind of <laughs> eased the shock of going into college you know i was kind of like 
oh, practice isn't so hard. You know, I've been doing this <laughs> for a while, so it wasn't. But it's just, I think the biggest shock is just being away from home. You know, it's not. You know, it feels like it was recent, but it kind of wasn't. You know, we didn't have smartphones yet, and it kind of wasn't the same thing. So you were really further away from home than you are now. If you go across the world, so it was. I think that was probably the biggest shock is being away from home. But I think college gave me more time than anything to just really work on myself as a player, and you know, work on my body, become stronger, work on my footwork, become a better defender, and really, you know, make some minor changes to my shot to, to really become a consistent shooter instead of being a streaky shooter. And it seems like nowadays is is quite popular for Finnish kids, good players, to try to get into universities in the states. Do you see any advantage to for Finnish kids going to the states to play? Uh, I think every player has to take their own path. You know, for some players it might be a great choice. For some, it might not be. And also, you know, picking your school can be difficult. And you know, I picked a school where. There were a lot of international kids, and I saw a lot of international kids who had gone pro. So I thought, figured that would be, you know, easier system for me coming from Finland, uh, even though I have an American father and have that background. But I still figured it would be easier. And it's just, you know, it's it's uh, it's a hard choice. You know, as a player, you don't know. I think the advantages of colleges are, you know, at the same time you get education, you get to play with your peers, people who are the same age, and the uh, competitiveness in the United States is just. It's different. People don't know. Like it's, yeah. it's brutal, you know. <laughs> If you don't play well, they're going to recruit a guy who's, you know, coming to take your spot. So you have to be at all times. You know, you have to be not just competitive, you know, against other teams, but even within your team, you have to be just the level of hunger has to be a different level because they're, you know, they're, there's always going to be somebody who want, who wants your spot where you're at. Exactly. Exactly. It's it's a whole different whole different ball game over over there. So do you think that your four years at Valparaiso prepared you to have a professional career. I think so. I think I was. I think I was still pretty raw at 19 or 20. You know, I was. I was kind of light. I wasn't really built to the body that I had as a professional. Uh, I was, you know, streaky shooter, as I said, and you know, I was athletic, but my defensive footwork, I don't think it was what it was when I went to, after I went to college and really guarded quicker players and learned how to handle the quickness there. So I, I feel like because I started basketball at a later age at 12, I really needed that time in college to really mature to the player that I will become. So you you started your professional career in 2008, if I'm correct. Yeah. And you're still playing. So how many countries have you played in? I think five, I think. Uh, professionally? Yeah. Five. Okay. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Is there one place that you enjoyed more than any other? I think uh, probably Germany at the end. You know, I think that I kind of found my home in Germany. I played my last six years there. I think that was really uh, I kind of found like just find before that I was kind of bouncing around. I kind of had like uh, I kind of had a career where you know I would always you know. Like I would fail, but I would always get up, you know, and prove myself. And then I go somewhere, and then something would happen. I would fail again, but I always, I always came back up. I always came back, and it was never uh, my my playing career was never linear. I never just went and just played. It was always there was always something happening, you know, good stuff, bad stuff, and I kind of had to overcome a lot of stuff in my career. But I felt like it really, uh, it really uh, kind of made me the person I am today and built me into the person, and I had to really, you know, uh, take some lumps along the way. But in the end, I think Germany was a place where I just kind of find really came into my own. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, re I remember, I remember your, your followed your German, German career. And, and you, like I said, Sean, you've, you've done well, you know, you, you keep, put, <laughs> you keep, you keep, you keep, you keep pushing, man. You keep yeah. pushing. And, <laughs> and I think that's, that's one of the keys to, to having a, yeah. uh, you know, a successful career uh during this time playing as a professional who do you think is the best player you ever played against professionally or do we count national team i'm not counting the next not not national <laughs> team right now professionally oh there were so many good players i don't know it's it's really tough you know greece we play against Panathinaikos, olympiacos like all the the greek legends there you know josh childers was there in olympiacos at the time and 
they had some really great guys, uh, Bayern Munich with uh, great teams there. And it's just, uh, I don't know, it's, it's hard to pick, it's hard to really to pick one player, you know, it's just, you do those battles. All I can say is it's been a lot of, a lot of really good players in the, in the, on the way. And even, even, you know, when I played a uh, second league in the, uh, Italy, like at the time it was, it was a, uh, it was a developing league, and a lot of those young players went on to play in different leagues. Some of them went to the NBA, some of them went Euro League. So it was like, at the time, there were maybe young unknown players, but they were really, really good guy players even then. And they went on to have great careers. So it's, it's just really tough to pick one guy. Do you have any games that stand out to you in your mind over over your professional career? That a game, let's say a game, you'll never forget. Yeah, I have I have one game. I was uh, uh, I was uh, well. I have a couple of games, but this one really stands up because not just because on the court, but also off the court stuff. So it was my first it was my first fall in Ludwigsburg. I had have a, I had had a really tough time uh, that that fall. You know, I was kind of I was in the funk. I didn't really notice it. My uh, my grandmother had passed away. You know, I was you know just just had a son, my firstborn, and you know not getting a lot of sleep, and I was just kind of you know trying to find my rhythm again. I wasn't playing well. I had come into a situation where it's pretty much like if I don't if I don't pick it up, I'm out of there. Like that's how professional basketball works. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, <laughs> but I, but you know, the coach wasn't like he was benching me, but he was still giving me a chance. And in okay. my mind, like as long as he puts me on the court, like even if it is for like one possession, I said I got a chance. I said I know I got a chance because if I make one shot, I can make another one, and then I can make a third one, and I can make a fourth one. And I knew and like. And it had been a couple of weeks and I played all right, but he had, you know, he wasn't really, I hadn't clicked it. I didn't get that game where I was in fire. And then finally, you know, you know, he puts me in a game. I make a shot and one, another layup. He, t- he pulls me out quick, you know, cause I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in the dog, you know? but I'm good. I'm okay, okay. He puts me back in, hit another three, hit another three. All of a sudden it's like, like he can't pull me out. I'm playing too well. I'm playing too well. Exactly. And I just, after yeah, and after that game, I I don't know how many points I ended up. Probably like 24, 25 points. And after that game, I just went on a hot streak. And like three months later, they're offering me a you know <laughs> two more years to stay there and play. And you just <laughs> you just turn around, but it's kind of it's kind of proof of how just you know uh, sometimes it's just you know little things can turn things around. And you know you can be in a slump, but if you, if you just keep believing in yourself and working hard, things can turn around. Even even if you're in the same situation. For sure, for for sure. So let's move on a little bit to the national team. Good. You've been you've been with the national team now for 15 years. Am I correct? Yes. Around 15, 15 years. You've seen a lot of changes during those 15 years. Talk a little bit about some of the changes. Well, I think um, you know, in the beginning, especially uh, you know, Henrik Detman, uh Metola Ranico, you know, some of the some of the veterans there and they really wanted to build, you know, a culture of, of winning. And they wanted to start with just basic things. And what it meant that, what it meant was that, you know, we have practice gear. Uh, we go to practice with a bus, you know, as a team and we eat together and we eat better together. We have better food, better accommodations. And we kind of raise the level of what we're doing, you know, out, off the court and on the court. And just better practices, more practices. And that way, if we can build a culture of where we're, you know, expected to win and expected to play well, you know, it wasn't that when I went to the national team. When I went to the national team, it was kind of, you know, just you just you're just kind of happy to be there. <laughs> and now, now, you know, if we don't, we, when we don't make the World Cup, we get criticized that you know, you know, we flopped. And <laughs> exactly. I could never imagine. <laughs> I could have never imagined that. And, you know, people I always say about the criticism, you know, because I started when they didn't even care about it. They didn't even write about us. No, nope, But now nope. when they critique us, I'm like, that's good that they even <laughs> care about basketball. <laughs> that, means that, that means they actually expect something of us. We weren't expected to do anything, you know, when I started. And it's just, you know, it's a long run. And it's nice to see. And it's also nice to see the, you know, the young players that we build that kind of, I've gotten to play with some of the young players that grew up not watching us when we were making that change. And the competitors that they are, kind of the expectations that they have, that they expect that this is the normal, that we go to the championships every year. And yeah, is, yeah. It's, it's nice to see that where it started from the ground floor, building that culture where now it's kind of almost, it's just normal. How many total games have you played with the national team? Uh, 204. 
That's the second most highest. Am I correct? Yeah. Behind, most behind because, Tuca? Yeah, behind, behind my roommate, Tuca. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, of Tuca, I got a question for you. Here's a question for you. <laughs> you and Tuca in your prime against me and your dad in our prime playing two against two, who would win? Uh, I'd say probably, uh, probably you guys, maybe. It depends who gets the ball first, too. I don't know. Like, it's not a lot of, I, I don't know. Like, I, like I, I played with you even when you're older, so I know, like, I know if you get that fadeaway going, I know we're done. It doesn't matter. <laughs> at that point, you're too tall. It doesn't matter who's guarding you. At that point, like... Exactly. Yep, there it it's is. It's an offensive there game, is. you know? There but if we is. get the ball first, I don't know. If we get the ball first, you know, maybe we can do some things. But, you know, people don't really know, like, the, the players that, you know, your generation were and, you know, how, how good you guys were, really, when you were playing. Like, you and my father and, you know... You know, Larry Pounds, you know, Gerald Lee, and, you know, uh, I'm probably forgetting some guys, but still, like, that generation was just, you know, you guys could do everything, you know, score, play defense, and you really brought it every night, and it's just, it's just, uh, you know, I've always had respect for that. I always, you know, lived close to it. I've always been there, and I, I always know what it meant, and it, it means a lot to me, and it's just, you know, I'm just, I'm just happy that I can kind of, you know, continue that as a second generation basketball player of that you know first generation of, of americans that came here and it's just a, it's kind of just a just an honor to carry that tradition on thank you thank you thank you and you know back during those days we we had to do it all man we we yeah. basically had yeah. we had to do it all because if we didn't do it if we didn't do it all they sending you home so we basically, exactly, yeah. we basically had to do it all. <laughs> yeah. So you've worked your way up to the captain of the men's national team. That must be quite a, a point of pride for you. It certainly is a point of pride for me because I know you. Uh, so for you, it must really feel good. Yeah, it was really, it was really a big honor. And it was kind of, you know, uh, you know, you know, Hondo being, you know, the captain for so long, he was kind of like, uh being the captain meant the same thing as Hondo, you know, for because he was always there. So even when he retired, like it didn't even cross my mind who would be captain. Like I'm like I was literally I was surprised when I was asked, like, hey, you want to be the captain of the team? I was like, what? I was like, <laughs> and then that, that's the point when it hit me. That's the point when it hit me, like, oh yeah, Hondo's not coming back. Like somebody else has to be the captain. Like it was just so normal. And I just I always took it as, you know, an honor, but as some, something that I really wanted to you know, carry with pride and I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, give back to the team as much as I could and kind of, kind of, you know, be my own self. And I remember that first year, it was a lot of pressure, you know, coming after Hanno and I tried to, you know, I tried different things, I do different things, but then I kind of figured out after a little while that, you know, I was picked to be the captain because who I am. So the best thing is just to be myself and, you know, try to be the best captain I, that I can that way. So when they, when they asked you, to be captain how long did it take you to say yes it took me a while it took me probably a day or something a day or two because i was in shock i was literally in shock like i told people around me i'm like i like oh my goodness they asked me to be the captain and i like and i asked some people and like and but then when i asked people around me it kind of seemed like i was the only person surprised <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah for so, sure. so <laughs> i was like wait so i guess so i guess okay and i, I thought i thought of it as a challenge and I thought, uh, and I thought, you know, yeah, this is this is this is going to be a cool thing. With with uh, high expectations placed on the national team now, how does the future look? Uh, I, f I like the future. I like how it looks. I think we have a lot of good young players. I think, I think the biggest thing that we've really uh, developed is like we used to be a team that had we were maybe twelve deep, you know. And then it kind of fell off. Like we didn't, we just didn't have that many, you know, high level players. But then if you look at the, if you look at, look at the map now and you look like where people are playing, like playing in Europe, playing in the States, we just have so many more players. Like we have camps with, we can have camps with like over 20, like 30, 
people and it's still you know it's competitive like everybody's competitive and it's just really like we we kind of we made the pool larger where to pick the players from and i think that's uh i think that's just a good place to be okay okay great so now let's talk a little bit about politics so your your basketball career is kind of winding down and you're starting a new career politics what make what made you decide to get in the game of politics when i was chosen to be a captain of the national team I, you know i got i got an opportunity to really speak on social issues and i felt i felt my platform and i felt like what i could do to help people that it really meant a lot and to be a role model and I started thinking at some point, you know, what if I got into politics and what if I could even help, you know, more people that way. And that was really, uh, really kind of something I wanted to do. And, you know, last year, you know, season ending early, really had time to think about things and think about, you know, what I want to do as my career is winding down. And now, you know, the opportunity came with the municipal elections to, you know, help, help with matters in Helsinki and really kind of, you know, represent all types of people. And it's just, uh, I just found that like, I just felt like, hey, this is, you know, this is something I really want to do. And I, I, I kind of found that as I, as I jumped into it and I started doing it, I found that I have like, I kind of have that similar fire in me doing it as I had when I started to play basketball. Like I kind of feel it inside me when I'm doing, like when I'm doing my campaign or getting ready to talk about social issues. I feel that, I feel that fire in me. And that's kind of yeah. something that I really want to, I really want to continue because I know, you know, basketball doesn't last forever, but this is something that I can, you know, I can I can take that fire that I had from basketball and kind of move it into politics and just try to help people. Who's your favorite politician? Oh, uh, <laughs> probably uh, Barack Obama. If we go just international, I mean, yeah. that was a huge moment of time just having a having a black president. And I read his book and just how kind of how he kind of how he deals with things and deals with matters. You know, one matter at a time and. And, and his just conflict resolution is really, uh, I think, uh, just, it's kind of been a role model for me. Okay, so what does Sean Huff stand for as a politician? Of course, equality, you know, equal rights for everybody and uh, hobbies for youth and children and, and helping kids move and, and, and fi finding sports and something because I feel like, you know, besides having a school system that's very equal here in Finland, I feel like we could also have a system where kids could have hobbies right after school and just just also also find their, you know, find kind of find their place in society and find a place where they can they can they can be themselves. And and it's just something that's not I don't, I don't know if it's true right now. It's, it's kind of expensive to, you know, be in different sports and it's not it's not available for every everybody It's really time consuming for parents to take their kids back and forth to different gyms. And it's something that I want to I want to see if I can help and if I can have some solutions and help build better. And and, and another thing that I really want to talk about is, is just representation. It's just having people in positions that look like you. We have a lot of kids growing up now or some kids growing up that I know that they've been in. Uh, they've they've grown up in Finland their whole life. But you know they don't they don't look the stereotypical Finnish way, so they're not they're not accepted as Finnish, so they don't really know who they are. They don't feel who they are. So I want to be kind of I want I want to show people that you know it doesn't matter you know what you look like in this country. You can you can do stuff and things are possible and you can find your place. And being Finnish doesn't just mean one thing. It doesn't mean you know it's one mold. We have a lot of different people, and I want to I want to show that that's possible in this country as well. Great point. Great point. So how do you think the, the current government is handling the COVID virus situation? Well, I mean, if you listen to Finnish people, you probably feel like a terrible job, right? <laughs> but, I, but, I feel, but I feel like I'd say generally pretty well. I mean, global pandemic is, I'm sure it's something that nobody was prepared for. I mean, even though people kind of talked about it, kind of knew it was possible, but when when it hit us, I felt like it was something that it was it was really tough. But I say generally speaking, compared to other countries, we we done we've done fairly well. Of course, maybe there's some things we could have done better. For sure, done some things better. But I think the the Finnish way is here. We always demand the best, and I think that's it. Kind of it kind of pushes us also to be a good country because we always even when things are okay or they're well it's not enough you know people are like nope it's not good enough <laughs> like we want better we want better and that's that's actually a good thing to have it's good to have that criticism it's good to always demand better from your you know 
elected officials. So, so it's, it just strives to make this country even a better place. You talk to a lot of a lot of young kids, a lot of youth. You go to a lot of camps and stuff. You've been to my camps and so forth. What do you tell young kids when you speak to them? A kid that wants to be Sean Huff. I want to tell them kind of what my parents told me is, you know, you gotta, you gotta have good grades. You have to, you know, you have to be in school. You have to try to, you know, you know, it's not always, it's not all about the sport. I had to perform at a certain level in school so I could play basketball. Basketball was like it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a, a given to me. So, so that's what I try to tell people. You know, you gotta, you know, you know, take care of your school. Do you know, do that, do that well, and then, you know, basketball and hobby. You know, just, you know, just have have fun. You know, work with it. If you really want to be good, good at something, you got to work with it. But if you, if it feels like work, it's going to be hard. But if you can make it playful and make it something that you really enjoy and love, then it's going to be easy. You're going to be practicing for hours, then you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna find yourself that that you're gonna get get better. But it's kind of like everything in life. If you just put in the minimum requirement hours, you're not gonna, you might, you're not gonna be the best you can. You have to, you have to find time on your own to make yourself better, just like with everything else. So with, with all of this said, uh, last question for you. What would a 36-year-old Sean Huff, what kind of advice would you give a 19-year-old Sean Huff? Oh, gosh, I was such a mess. <laughs> 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 I, feel like, I, feel like we, I feel like we go through, I feel like we go through life in intervals where like at 19, you feel like you know everything. And then ten years later, you feel, you feel, you realize you didn't know anything. <laughs> but then, ten, but then ten years after that, you realize again that you didn't know, you really didn't know anything, <laughs> and so on. But I would just say, you know, keep doing what you love and and stay stay with it. And you know, you know, things aren't always going to be easy, but it's the you know, it's the hard times that really, you know, those are the parts that build us and kind of makes the person that we are today. And it's just, it's just. That's kind of what I would say. It's just keep, you know, keep working hard and just just believe. Have you have you noticed how much smarter your your, your parents look as you get older? You know, when you were 15, 16, they tell you something you didn't want to hear. It. You're like, I, you know oh, what yeah. you're talking about. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. It's like, <laughs> but, but it's true. I feel like when you have your own kids, you finally, it brings you closer to your own parents. Because you finally ha you have this aha moment, like when your you get these flashbacks to when your parents are telling you stuff. And you're just like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I was an idiot. Why? What was I doing? But it's just, it's just a part of growing up. I feel like we all go through it. You know, our parents, you know, they try to help us, but when you're 15, you just feel like you're on top of the world and you know everything, and you want to do this, you know, and that. And I also, I also admire how, like, kind of like my parents, they let me you know, do things that maybe they thought weren't the best thing, but they kind of let me do my mistakes so I could learn from them. Instead of cuddling me and not, you know, not letting me live, they kind of let me go through the phases myself. And I felt like that also helped me grow. And that's, and now as, as a parent myself, I understand how hard that must be because as a parent, a lot of times you feel like, you know, it's good, but you have to let the kid kind of figure it out for themselves. And that's just, that's, it's tough, man, tough. Well, at, at this point, Sean, I'm gonna I'm gonna thank you for for stopping by, man, and, and sharing sharing some time with us. And before we go, I'm gonna answer this trivia question. Ezekiel Elliott, Dallas Cowboys running back, has a connection to Finland through his grandfather, Leon Huff, who is Sean's father. So there's a there's a family full of sports stars. I'm gonna say thank you, Sean, and I'm I'm gonna say good luck to you. And good thank luck you. in the playoffs, good luck in the election, and Anybody out there that lives in Helsinki listening to this, get out and vote Sean Huff. There Thank it you. Is. Thank you very much. All this right. This was Sean. a pleasure. Thank you. See you, man. See you. Thanks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Bernard Harris, and welcome to B Talk.